Good morning and happy Sabbath, dear church, uh, to Larry Seven Day Adventist Church. I'm so happy to be with you today. This is going to be our last sermon where we're not in church because next week we're going to open the church. We're going to be able to worship together. I'll continue to have on the sermons uh, taped like this um, in order to provide uh, for those who are not able to come to church, uh, the sermon. But I'm so happy to be with you this morning. And I know the Lord has a, a blessing to, for us. So I want to pray uh, together. I invite you to pray so we can invite the Holy Spirit uh, into our midst, our presence, that He may guide us and glorify Himself through the preaching and the teaching and the hearing of His Word. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, that this is the last Sabbath that we will not uh, be in church, Father. Next week, we are going to go back to church, Father. We're going to worship you, Lord. And, Father, we just thank you so much, uh, Father, that we can come to you in prayer. So, please, oh, Lord, bless us at this moment. Bless us with the Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Help us. Change us. Transform us. Allow us to see what it is that you want us to do today. So please, Father, bless us through the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling in our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So my friends, as you have known, we continue to be um, at speaking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our greatest need. It's the most essential and complete gift that heaven has given to humanity. And he wants that gift to be complete in us. You know, it brings us all the graces in heaven to our life to be able to transform us. Last week, we talked about the need to be baptized daily. How we need to look for the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, the daily indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We must walk in the Spirit. So today, we're going to talk about life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. Have you ever heard the concept heart and minds? Heart and minds. In the war, there is a different ways of, of defeating the enemy. Different ways of defeating the enemies. Uh, back in the day, it was ethically acceptable uh, by nations to completely eradicate other nations. It happened through, through war. It happened through assimilation. It happened through different means. Today, we know that that is not the right thing to do. It's not ethical. It's not even moral to eradicate um, a, 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 another nation, another group of people. That's not something that, that takes place. However, how do you defeat an enemy? How do you defeat an enemy that is seeking to, to destroy, to conquer you? And there's two ways to do it. To do it, there's an external way where you impose external forces upon the the object, which is the enemy, to try to uh, uh, to destroy it from without. And there is an internal way coming inside, working within the lines of the enemy to change and to transform the uh, the war, the enemy. This is called the method of hearts and minds. You know, it's a military tactic that has been used for many, many, for many years, for many centuries. And the idea of this uh, method is that rather than to just exhort, exert, exert external force upon a subject in order to overcome, to win, um, you do you you exert internal forces because if externally you continue just defeating defeating you take out one weed another one comes up but if you go inside and you change and you win the hearts and the mind of the enemy where the enemy realizes you know what these guys are really not my enemy these guys are really here trying to give me a better way of life trying to show me something different once you fight the war from inside then that's how victory takes place. And this is exactly what God wanted of his people. He realized that his people had been engaged in the war against sin. From the beginning, as sin entered this world, the heart in, it began a war that from the moment that you were born to the moment that you die, this war is constant. It's, 
It's selfishness. It's, it's self. It's the flesh fighting against the spirit. And the Lord said, you know, my people are not able. They're not able to win externally. They need something to take place internally. And this is what the Bible picks up all the way through Scripture. If you have if you have a Bible, I invite you to open to the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 11. And here we're going to see this passage where God is, is, is declaring that he's going to do a different thing. He's going to have a new tactic. He's not going to just wait so that his people change externally because it's impossible. In fact, uh, that has led to his people actually disobeying and being sent to exile. So Ezekiel chapter 11 talks to us about all of this, okay? It says here, Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get far away from this land. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, Although I have cast them afar off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in their countries where they have gone. Therefore say, Thus, the, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you, from the peoples, assemble you from countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they will go there, and they will take away all his detestable things, and all his abominations from there. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put one spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statues and keep my judgments and do them. And, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those heart, for those whose hearts follow the de desires for the detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. It's a powerful passage here. A passage where God says, you know what, tell my people. Tell my people who, who have been scattered, who have been sent all abroad, who have been uh, uh, taken captive. Tell my people that I will bring them back. I'm going to bring them back to this land. And while I bring them back, wherever they may be found, even though the sanctuary is not there because it was destroyed in Jerusalem, even though the sanctuary is not there, I will be a sanctuary to my people. I will be with them. I will keep them safe. And I'm going to bring them back. But when they come back, when they come back, there's something different going to take place. Because you know what? They w were scattered. They were sent apart because in their hearts, they held on to detestable things. Things that are not honorable. Things that are not right. Things that are not moral. And it's because of these things that they have... Uh, incur the punishment they have incurred the discipline of God in order for them to learn that that a new a new thing needs to take place in their hearts and in their lives and what is that new thing Jesus says God says and I will give them one heart a united heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart of flesh and and give them a new heart what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work from within. You know, Israel tried, attempted to externally keep the law, but they failed. They can't do it because of the flesh. The heart, you know, follows things that are not right, detestable. So I'm going to do a new work in them. And this new work is actually going to do a transformation in their actions, in their ethics, in their behaviors. This new work, this 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 tr heart transplant is going to do a new work in them that then they will be able to follow my judgments. They will be able to follow my statutes. They will be able to follow my words. You know, Jesus is declaring and had declaring the Old Testament that the problem that we uh, humans have is a heart problem. We have a heart problem. It, 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 the spirit is given to change the heart. My friends, the problem always is where our heart is. It's always a heart problem. So God says, you know what, I'm going to work within man to change their heart. 
And this is something that we see throughout the Old Testament, throughout the, the prophets, declaring this work that God will do. Look, here in Ezekiel later, in the same book, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. It's a repetition of what we just read. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. God is repeating the same same message from through Ezekiel. This is when the people of God were in, in captivity. Remember Ezekiel, he is a prophet in Babylon. And, and he's telling God, his people, I'm going to give you a new heart. I need to change your heart. We need a heart transplant. The problem is the heart. I'm going to do something new. Something new. Because my people on their own, they can't do it. And uh, Jeremiah 31, 33 says this. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So God says, look, a new covenant is coming. It's going to come and take place. And that covenant is different and different. We have not studied the covenant, so we don't have time to go into it. But the reason why a new covenant was needed is because the old covenant didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because God gave us a bad covenant? <laughs> no, it didn't work because the old covenant experience was one where the people tried of their own will, of their own volition, of their own strength to keep the law of God. And that's why the covenant couldn't be, the covenant kept being broken. That's why the covenant could not realize its work in us that it, it, it God wanted to. Because as human beings, without Christ, we can't do anything. So that's what a new covenant is given. And in the in the book of Hebrews, this covenant is ratified. Well, actually, it's not ratified in the group, group of he in the book of Hebrews. The covenant is ratified at the death of Jesus. But the book of Hebrews, chapter eight and nine, it specifically tells us what the covenant involves, why it's a better covenant. And it's it's not a new covenant that just comes out in the New Testament. It's a covenant that comes from the Old Testament. And this is where it comes from. Where God is saying, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit. So God from the Old Testament times was already preparing to give us a new covenant. A covenant where He is working in our hearts. Where He is changing us internally from within so that we can have a new life in Christ. And that covenant, it's seen in practical terms in, in the New Testament through the life of Jesus Christ, but also through the life of the church. And here in cha Romans chapter 8, um, Paul actually speaks about the experience of the new covenant in the life of a believer. So this is where we're going to jump into the meat and potatoes of our subject. We just seen that God is going to do a new work, that God is going to work from inside in order to conquer uh, sin in our hearts. God is going to work from within and give us a new heart, a new life. Uh, he's going to do a surgery in our hearts and give us a transplant, a new heart. Okay. So here in Romans chapter, we can actually start seeing the praxis, the, the practical terms on how the on how the Holy Spirit will work in our lives, how that new spirit will transform us to have a new heart, okay? So let's begin at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in it was weak through the flesh. God, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what is the Bible telling us? That those who are walking in according to the spirit they have no condemnation there's nothing to condemn a christian a christian who is walking by the holy spirit so the holy spirit frees us from condemnation and and, and to walk in the holy spirit means to be 
in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ means to walk in the Holy Spirit. You see, being in Christ is 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 accepting right Christ, uh, 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 allowing Christ to be the Lord, uh, the Savior of your life. You come into Christ, but once you come into Christ. Uh, the life does not turn passive. It doesn't mean that now I don't do anything. I'm just going to sit here in my life. No, we have to take action. And that action is walking according to the Spirit, right? And as we walk according to the Spirit, as we experience the Spirit, the Spirit, the law of the Spirit makes us free from the law of sin and death. How is that? Because when we are walking by the Spirit, the Spirit guides us in righteousness, in right doing. It guides us in in, in the Spirit-filled life that the law can condemn. Because the, the law condemns sin. The law condemns wrongdoing. But if we are walking in the Spirit, Spirit doing right doing, there's no wrongdoing in our lives. So then, guess what? There is no condemnation. So the Spirit helps us to do uh, to do what the law by itself can never have done. You know, in the Old Testament, especially in the time of, of Jesus, the God was trying to 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 lead His people from a, 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 a old covenant experience to a new covenant experience. The old covenant experience is when the human being out of its, his own volition, his own uh, strength tries to keep the law of God. We can't do it. We cannot live in the old test, uh, the old covenant experience. The old covenant, remember that there's nothing wrong with the old covenant. The old covenant, the, the new covenant is based on the old covenant. However, the, uh, the, the trying to keep the old covenant by your own works, that's what's it's not, it's not going to be able to happen. But with the new covenant, with the Holy Spirit, by allowing the Holy Spirit to live and dwell in us, then we are able to have a new covenant experience and we are then able to keep the law of God. That's exactly what verse 4 says. It says that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. So the law can be fulfilled in us. We can keep the law, but the only way to do it is not according to the flesh. If I try to do it out of my own works, uh, out of my own strength, guess what? It's not going to happen. It's only going to happen in if I allow the Holy Spirit to work in me, to live in me. And all of this is possible because of what verse 3 says. Verse 3 says, this is possible because God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. The only right reason we are able to walk in the newness of life in the spirit is because, the, is because Jesus Christ came into this world and he was victorious against sin, against uh, a death, against against sinfulness he was he lived a perfect life he lived a holy life without any sin and because of that life that jesus lived and because he died and condemned sin with his death then he gives us his life he gives us the holy spirit and we can have a new life it's all because of jesus and but it's not all alone jesus because jesus has helpers the holy spirit and god the father and the helper lives in us. So it is by the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling in us that we are able to have a victorious life against sin. So you see why it's so important for us to speak about the Holy Spirit, to dwell on the Holy Spirit, to seek the Holy Spirit. It's so important for us because the only way we can have a victorious life in Christ where we can overcome those things that beset us, the things that discourage us, those things that pull us back is by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only as the Holy Spirit dwells in us and we walk in the Spirit, obey the Spirit, listen to the Spirit that we can have a new and victorious life. And this is what Paul is trying to get us to understand. That the battle between the flesh and the spirit is a real thing. And the only way that we can actually have victory is with the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, he continues here in Romans chapter 8 verses 5 through 8 saying the following. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. 
but those who live according to the Spirit, the, uh, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, is at war against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, for indeed, nor it can indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Paul is saying it, the battle's real, my friends, my friend. The battle, whether you are not in church, whether whether you just came into church, or whatever you just or you've been in church forever, whether you're not a Christian, whether you're just a new Christian, or you been a Christian forever, the struggle is real. The battle is real. So Paul is telling us, look, the the flesh, the flesh, our sinful flesh is at constant war with the spirit that's why we need a constant renovation we need a constant restoration we need a contest re a constant rebaptism of the holy spirit because paul is saying look look you know those who set their minds on fleshly things are of the flesh and they're working against the spirit in their own hearts and but those who set the their their minds on the spirit those who set on their minds on the things of god there are of god my friends the struggle is real there is a battle in our hearts we feel it every day because as much as we try hard to to walk in the way of god to be led by the holy spirit our flesh is constantly deviating from what god wants us to do and you, you can know this because you don't even have to be doing nothing right you can just be sitting down and all of a sudden these thoughts pop up, right? And, and, and you, you, you ask yourself, where does this come from? It comes from our broken flesh. From our broken flesh. And, and, and so we have to constantly uh, uh, captivate all thoughts uh, under Christ, right? So I know this has happened to you. Where a temptation arises in your mind. And, 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 but you come to the Holy Spirit. God, help me. God, help me. Oh, give me strength. God, you know, let this thought get out of my mind. And what happens? Boom! It's gone. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was was solicited for help. You see, you see, the Holy Spirit is 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 meant to constantly take our minds from the things of this world to the things from above. To focus on the things that matter and the things. And, and this is not something esoteric, right? It's not something just like in theory. It's something in practice because our thoughts become actions. Our actions are come from our thoughts. So what I mean is this, that uh, when we are constantly looking at things from heaven, when we engage people on a daily, uh, on a, on a daily uh, uh, you know, basis, where we talk to somebody on the, uh, on the store or, or, or a family member, even though we're having a, a conversation, maybe not of, world, uh, of heavenly things, our words are going to be uh, words that speak life into people. They, they give encouragement. Our words will be things spirit-filled. So that's why God wants us always to be constantly connected to the Spirit. Because wherever we are at, whatever the context may be, whether you're in a religious setting or not, the Spirit wants to guide us always so that we can always have heavenly things and focus. So, brothers and sisters, the struggle is real. The flesh is constantly in war with the spirit. The struggle is real. That's why we need the spirit of the Holy, the Holy Spirit in us, the spirit of the Holy God in us, because he is our only help in this battle. Look, now Paul begins to talk about life in the spirit, right? This this battle, this battle, it's taking place. But let's live a different way. Let's actually have life in the spirit, a life that is not of this world. It doesn't focus on these things of this world. Uh, Paul continues saying, verses nine through eleven, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his and if christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is li is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him whom who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you this is powerful i wish we can just 
focus uh, 40 minutes on this. This is powerful. Check it out. So it's saying here, I'm going to go a little uh, detour. Here, uh, the names for the for the Holy Spirit, he got different names. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Synonymous, right? Because here is the idea that, that the Spirit is part of the Godhead. He's part of the Trinity. Uh, the Trinity, right? Well, we we can we're gonna talk about that eventually. We're gonna talk about how God, uh, how the Spirit is God Himself dwelling in us. But check that out. Check this out. Look, here, um, what this is saying is that that you have the Spirit. We are we accepted Jesus Christ. The Spirit is in us, so we will know if the works of the Spirit is being uh, manifested in our lives. And what's so powerful is this. Look, this is the key to have a life, having life, a life abundantly. This is the key to having life in our uh, in this life that we live, right? The key to having life is is that same power. Pa Paul says that same power, that same power that resurrected Jesus from the death. That same power is working in you. And that same power will give you life to resurrect your bodies into a life, a true life, not in the life of the old self, the self that has that has egotism, right? That has selfishness, that has uh, angriness, bitterness. Uh, 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 what else? <laughs> Let me think of all these things, right? Uh, 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 judging other people, right? Being uh, uncourteous, being untactful, being blunt, uh, being you know all that way, old way of life. The Holy Spirit will give you life so you don't have to be like that, right? It says, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have gone away. You see, the Spirit, the resurrected, the miracle, the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus is the same power that lit, wants to live in you and give you life. Because you know what? It only It would take a miracle to change us. Yeah, some of us are so made of stone. We have hearts of stone that it, it would take a miracle. And that same miracle power that worked in the resurrection of Jesus is working in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that's why it's so important for us to be engaged with the Holy Spirit. That's why we've been spending time talking about the Holy Spirit. I know some of you may be like, man, Pastor, can you talk about something else? <laughs> Where you're like, man, like, I'm up to here with, with the Holy Spirit. But you know what? That's the flesh. <laughs> That's the flesh, you know, <laughs> telling you, hey, let's go somewhere else, you know. Let's not listen to this. No, the Holy Spirit is wanting to give life into our hearts, my brothers and sisters. And we need the Holy Spirit to have that life in us. Look at what this a theologian wrote this. He, a the, he says this, Paul's point is rather to remind his readers that only those who have the Spirit can claim to be Christ. Only those who li whose lives demonstrate by character and conduct that the Spirit is directing them can claim to be under Christ's Lordship. My brothers and sisters, this is vital. Why? Because here, is a, a, this is calling us to re-examine our lives. This is calling us to constantly examine our lives. Because look... Just because you've been in church forever, just because you are a pastor, just because you are, uh, uh, you know, an elder or whatever it may be, your responsibility, your duties or how great your education may be or whatever it may be, you know, this is a point that telling us, look, those things there, don't, good, God has called you, that's great, God is working with us, but what's important is the manifestation of the Spirit in our lives. That's how you know that you are walking in in the way that the Lord uh, wants you to do. Because just being a pastor doesn't mean that everything's all right. <laughs> you know what? We need to be in the Spirit so that the Spirit can work through us, you know? So, brothers and sisters, this is calling us to, to examine ourselves and, and where we fought short. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is wanting to... He's actually pointing those things out in your life so that you can have... Power to overcome those things. Yeah, you want to be different. You want to be more social. You want to be more able to speak in front. You want to be able to share your faith with others. You want to be not deceived. You want to be, uh, um, you know, ready for the Lord's coming. Guess what? That's for the Holy Spirit. 
Walk in the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit change you. God can change you. God can take away all those things. My friends and my brothers and sisters, it's not good enough to say, this is just the way I am and this is how I'm going to be. No, my friends, that is not sufficient. The Lord is trying to change us and He can change you. He can change us. And that's why we need the Spirit in our life. So that the works of the Spirit may be manifested in our lives. And we have no doubt that we are children of God. Victory by the Spirit. Look, Paul continues to speak about this concept of a victory, of having new a new life. Look at what Romans chapter 8 verse 12 says. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So my friends, we are Christians. Let's not live by the flesh. Let's not walk by the flesh. Let's not be pulled by the flesh. Let's not give the flesh dominion on our lives. We are no longer of this world. We are Christ. And no matter how hard you have tried to change, God can change you. But you see, we are not able to crucify the flesh of our own self-will. No matter how much we try to stop to sin in our own flesh, strength we will not be able to because the only thing that can crucify the flesh the only thing that can put the flesh to death in our life guess what who it is it is the holy spirit <laughs> that's why there is a re a necessity of a renewal of baptism daily daily constantly because the holy spirit needs to be pushing down and destroying those fleshy, selfish tendencies that we have in our lives. Only through the flesh do we have victory over sin. The Holy Spirit is the only agency in the world that can defeat the yearnings, right? The yearnings like a drug addict, right? And desires of the flesh. Only the Holy Spirit alone, my friends, the Holy Spirit alone is the only agency. Not self, not strength, not anything else. Only the Holy Spirit, my friends. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's why we need to live in the Holy Spirit. We need to walk in this Holy Spirit. We need to be guided by the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, my friends. Because the only way that we are going to be able to crucify the self, self uh, flesh, to be victorious over sin is if the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is in our hearts. That's the only way. That's the only way. You know, that's why, <laughs> that's why, <laughs> man, I'm just thinking of Revelation chapter 3, right? The loudest in church, right? What does God want to give them? He wants to give them, you know, a cloth, right? To clothe their nakedness. He wants to give them rich. I mean gold so that they can be rich. But he wants to give them eye self. To anoint their eyes so that they see their real necessity. The remnant church of God. Above all things. Needs the baptism of the Holy Spirit the most. Because that is the missing link in the chain. That once the character of God through the Holy Spirit is produced in God's people. The the, the chains of events of the end times will just keep going. They'll go. So we need the Holy Spirit. Look, we're going to finish with this here. Sonship in the Spirit. Uh, verses 14 to 17. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. So what does it say here? That, that, that we can know that we're Christians because something is starting into our hearts. Something has started in our hearts. We don't want to be like we, we used to be. We don't want those things in the past. We want a new life. We want something better. And, and we are, and we recognize that. And it's the Spirit in us that makes us cry, Father, give us more of your Spirit. Father, give us more of transformation. And But you see, Paul is trying to it hit home. Look, because you guys are children of God. Don't, don't, short, don't sell yourself short. 
Don't stop. Don't give up. Keep pursuing. Keep fighting. Keep looking for the Holy Spirit. Suffer like you did Christ. How did God, Christ suffer? Christ suffered because he never gave in to selfishness. Christ suffered because he fought against sin. In the same way, my children, you fight against sin. You suffer against sin. You suffer against the fight against sin. You suffer because you crucify sin and selfishness in your life. Crucify. If you do those things, if you walk in the Spirit, you let the Spirit take over in your life, guess what's going to happen? You will be glorified. You will be ready for the second coming. You know, focus on, don't focus on fighting sin. Focus on being filled with the Holy Spirit because it's a, a natural consequence of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit is a fighting sin. <laughs> you see that? So, so you know, here saying, look, we are sons. We are sons and daughters. Receive the Holy Spirit. It is through the dwelling of the Spirit that we are transformed in sons and daughters of God. Complete sons and daughters of God. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that that transformation it's completed in our lives and we are ready for glorification, which will only take place at the second coming. So my friends, we have talked a lot about the Holy Spirit today and I'm just so excited. I mean, this is just awesome. You know, I, I, it, we just need to sit down and study the word of God, but check this out. Let's do a summary. Okay. God prophesied in the old Testament about the day that, that he would win the hearts and minds of his people through the working of the Holy Spirit. God in the Old Testament, he already said, you know what? Something new needs to take place. My people are not getting it. They can't depend on themselves. They need to depend on me. Two, it is through the indwelling of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Excuse me. It is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that gives us freedom for the constant battle against the flesh. It is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that gives us freedom for, from the constant battle against the flesh. So it's, it's the Spirit that gives us freedom, that gives us victory, that, 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 that keeps us away from being condemned by the law, being condemned by the flesh. It is Jesus through the Holy Spirit that we have freedom. And lastly, in the Holy Spirit, we find victory and power to live a new life as the sons and daughters of God. It's only through the Holy Spirit, my friends. So what must I do? What must we do, church? What are we supposed to do after we hear this sermon and we go, we go about our day? What are we supposed to do? Daily, daily, we need to seek the Holy Spirit baptism. We need to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, obey the Spirit, have fellowship with the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit dwell in you, in us. My friends, this is what we need to do daily, my friends. It's about Jesus. It's about God. It's about the Holy Spirit. This is the only way that we are going to be able to keep the law, to be able to be victorious over sin, to be able to do the work of God, to be transformed into the character of God. That's the only way. And remember... The Holy Spirit always leads us to Scripture, so I'm not advocating a new, uh, a new hermeneutic or a new uh, a, 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 a way apart from the Scriptures. Not at all, because the Spirit is the Spirit of Truth that will lead us into all truth, even the truth that is demonstrated in our lives. So, my friends, what do we need to do? Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Is that your desire, my friends? Is it your desire to be filled of the Holy Spirit constantly? Is it your desire for the Holy Spirit to fill you every day, every moment? In fact, do you want to be filled again by the Holy Spirit right now? Do you yearn in your heart? Do you have the overwhelming desire for the Spirit to be the driver of your, of your heart? To be the driver of your life? Do you want the Holy Spirit to be make you new? To truly give you victory? Maybe you feel discouraged and you say, Man, you know what? I have fought and, and fought against the sin and temptation, but I can't overcome it. Yes, my friend, you're not able to. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is not impossible. Remember what Jesus says. If, 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 if He says, if you believe all is possible to him that believes, there is nothing impossible for God. It might be impossible for us, my friends, but all things are possible 
for God. So yes, God can change you. Yes, God can transform you. Yes, the Holy Spirit can baptize our church into Larry Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the Holy Spirit can help us, the church, live like Christ to be able to redeem those in the community who are willing, awaiting, eagerly waiting for the manifestations of the sons and daughters of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit wants to fill us. Do you want Him to fill your life? Do you want Him to give you a new life? Do you want Him to give you victory over sin? Do you want Him to lead you into all the truth? Do you want Him to give you the sonship of Christ in your life? Do you want to have a new life in Christ? Do you want to be sanctified, transformed? Do you want the Holy Spirit? Is that your desire? If it's your desire, I invite you to pray with me and ask the Holy Spirit to make you new, to give you that heart transplant that He desires to do. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. I am with my brothers and sisters of the faith. I am so happy to be able to share, Father, your word within, the word that fills me with so much joy, Father, that gives me encouragement that you can transform me, Lord. Thank you so much, Father, for Christ. Thank you so much for the gospel. Thank you so much for the Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you so much for what you desire to do in each and every one of us today, Lord. But, Father, we are here humble, broken vessels seeking and desiring the heavenly manna from heaven, Father. We are all beggars, Father, all beggars, leading other beggars to get the bread from heaven, Father. My brothers and sisters who are hearing me, Father, have a desire for the Holy Spirit, have a yearning for the Holy Spirit. They want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, heavenly Father, fill us, God. Fill us, fill us into our cup. Run it over, Father. Fill us until we cannot be filled no more, Lord. Please, Father, help us understand, Father, our necessity of the Holy Spirit. Because it's only through the Holy Spirit that we are able to have a new life in Christ. So, Father, bless us. Keep us safe. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, my friends, I'm so happy you spend this time with me today um, is hearing the word of God. You know, I know God is doing wonderful things in our lives. Um, remember, we're going to be here next week. Next week, we're going to be in church. So don't miss out. Come to church. God has something special for us to next week. And also, I'm going to be sending out a message, uh, uh, a video on what we need to do when we come back to church. Well, my friends, I pray and I have confidence that the Lord has blessed you and the Lord is directing your mind to heavenly things and soon even at this moment, the Spirit already has come into your life and you will see the manifestation of the Spirit in your life. My brothers and sisters, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit because that's the only way to live this life. Thank you so much for your time. God bless you. Have a wonderful and happy Sabbath.